when I look at your resume, uh, especially in politics, um, you know, from being an educator, a young educator in London, to coming back to South Africa, assuming your role in parliament as the deputy chief whip, all the way to being international relations uh, minister. What is the most impactful role do you think you've assumed in your uh, lifetime career? Probably education, uh, I, I would think. Um, you know, many people don't know that the National Student Financial Aid Scheme uh, began as a, a trust called the Tertiary Education Fund for South Africa, or TEFSA. TEFSA, yes. I was a member of the first uh, board of TEFSA, um, and we are the ones who conceived of the funding for uh, young black students with the partial bursary, partial loan idea. And my dream at the time was that this will become a, a big national scheme. We began with a million rand uh, in 1992, and look at where we are today mm -hmm. in billions. My uh, uh, happiest moment was when our second minister of education in a free South Africa, Professor Kada Asmal, introduced the legislation to establish the National Student Financial Aid Scheme and so to convert TEFSA to NISFAS. So I feel, having been in TEFSA and argued for a larger national scheme, that this is one of the outcomes uh, you know, of my role uh, in, in education. When you think <coughs> of education today, we've got a, a young minister who's taken up that role uh, in the government of national unity. When you think of education today where it is now, um, what comes to, to mind? What do you think are the uh, pitfalls? Um, what do you think are the necessary areas of concern to you? And where have we excelled in, um, in making sure that education is, is aligned to everyone encompasses because we had Bantu education for quite some mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. in, the, in the apartheid era. What, what are the gains and, and where do we need to still achieve? I can write a whole thesis on this. Um, so I think that we have made a tremendous progress as South Africa, but given our history, there are many, many uh, challenges still. For me, uh, the biggest success is the reality that we have near universal access uh, to schooling for the children of South Africa, and that we've achieved this in the first decade of freedom. This is extremely important. Many countries take many, many years to get to where we went from the beginning. Because uh, you will recall that President Mandela, when he made his first policy speech as president of a democratic South Africa, indicated 10 years of compulsory education for all children as the policy of the new government. And for us to have actually pursued that and achieved it, I think is really significant for our country. Our key issue is, of course, the quality of what we offer. And uh, I think, uh, given uh, the impact of Bantu education on our aspiration for excellence, uh, aspiration for quality, it is not surprising that really the pursuit of quality will be the long-term endeavor. Uh, of, of education. Nonetheless, uh, we do have pockets uh, of excellence and we need to appreciate that. I am uh, one of the people in our country who believes we focus too much on the negative and inadequately on the progress. And if you lift out the progress, you change the consciousness of a nation toward seeking excellence. So I think we need to address you know, our mind and how we view ourselves then we'll aspire for something different. I also believe in higher education, uh, we've made incredible progress. To have six of our universities ranked among the top 100 of the world, this is fantastic, uh, given you know, the extension of higher education of Universities Act, uh, which was passed by the apartheid state to curb uh, excellence uh, in higher education, and particularly black access.
One of the big moments <clears throat> for me was in 2014, <clears throat> please excuse me, when uh, we achieved a majority of PhD graduates being black people. Uh, this again signaled a major advance uh, for our country. So as I said, you know, I could go on and on. But I think uh, the biggest problem and worry for me is that education remains a contested space it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Education is the site where your country advances. And if it is contested, it's going to be very difficult to really gain the level of success that you desire. So I hope that the, uh, the new ministers, both higher education as well as basic education, are going to try to um, get national consensus on what we need to do and get everybody, communities, parents, educators, academics, students, behind the enterprise of achieving quality and excellence in education. I, I think of the, the correlation in your time when you were a student activist in Botswana to the student activism that uh, happened, I think it, it was 2017, the um, uh, Freeze Must Fall movement. Um, what, what was uh, going through your mind during that time? Was it reminiscent of your own uh, uh, activism? And uh, did you think that it was a, a, a movement that had credibility and that the, the students really uh, had a, a, a reason to cry out to government? Well, the nature of struggle has changed over time, mm -hmm. obviously. And uh, I found aspects of how the students uh, waged their protest uh, really troubling uh, uh, for our society, particularly aspects of violence, uh, uh, you know, forcing others to join in and that sort of thing. But the uh, objective was an important objective. And I think it was necessary that the voices of students uh, are heard. Where I was concerned was that there didn't appear to be clarity as to who the beneficiaries of this free education should be. South Africa is a country with vast disparities in terms of wealth and income status. And for everyone to have free education uh, seemed to me uh, not to recognize the nature of inequality in our country. There are those who can pay and who should pay, and there are those who totally cannot afford and yet have the talent to access a higher education. So the absence of that distinction uh, made the call uh, too uh, subjective for me. Mm. I believed it needed uh, uh, some insertion of this complexity of an unequal society. Mm. I, I want to now move towards uh, your years in, in cabinet, Ma. Uh, you were a minister of higher education, you were a minister of education, minister of home affairs, and inter international relations, and so forth. Um, there was a time, <clears throat> and I know you don't want to dwell in the negative, but there was a time, those, those 10 years, uh, some people will say, so the nine years, some people will say the nine wasted years. When you think about uh, those years, do you, do you agree? Was it, was it really a, a wasted time? Did, were there any accomplishments, do you think, that when, uh, were not necessarily given uh, the right profile? I'm always uh, uh, worried about the terminology you know, that, mm. that we use. Uh, I think in those nine years, there was terrible corruption in our country. There was also the state capture and so on. But government continued to function in various uh, sectors. But the level of abuse was really problematic. Uh, and some of us were fighting mm. uh, against that. Uh, we don't go and you know, write in the papers about ourselves. Uh, but we tried to keep uh, uh, probity and integrity in the work that we did. But yes, I do think we went through a really awful period uh, where there was a lot of thievery uh, of uh, public resources and more interest uh, in lining the pockets of certain individuals in business, because we shouldn't forget the role mm. of the private mm. sector, as well as uh, some politicians. 
would you, was there ever a time where you wanted to give up? Was there ever a time where you felt you could not stay any longer in, the, in, in, in that position? No, because I thought if I go out, it's going to get worse. Mm. So I had to do my work, protect the resources I had responsibility for. I also, uh, uh, you know, as an African, I have an appreciation of the notion of community. Mm. But as a, a person brought up in a particular way, I believe individuals have responsibility for their ethics and integrity. So I don't appropriate the fault of all people, nor do I insert myself, you know, in a group uh, that is doing. I, so I believed I have responsibility for this six billion mm. in home affairs. I must ensure that it is utilized in terms of the law and utilized in service of the people. Uh, and that's how I've conducted myself. Now, it might be a fault in that I don't join groups and say, you know, let's do something together. But I was brought up that I must have ethics, I should have responsibility, and I must conduct myself with integrity. And wherever I've been, I can tick that I've tried to do that. And, and that integrity has shown, Ma, in, in, in that... I don't think anyone in in South Africa, white, black, Indian, or colored, whatever color or race, can fault you in terms of how you've conducted yourself in government. Um, what? Why did you have? What? What sustained you um, in terms of your integrity, your morals, your ethics uh, in government when so many people were faltering? Well, it's my family. Mm -hmm. I don't want the name of the family to be reflected in a terrible way uh, in public media or any other form of media. I have a responsibility to my country, to the people of my country, but most particularly to where I come from, to my family. Uh, and I would be deeply ashamed if the name of my family, either Matthews or Pando, were associated uh, with anything negative. And this was always uh, uh, my, my fear, is that never, don't allow that, ever. You know, even if there were to be some form of a temptation. And fortunately, depending on how you conduct yourself, people come to realize. And so they won't come and talk nonsense to you. They might try once, but they soon get it, that, hey, you know, with this one, mm. sorry, just, mm. just forget it. Mm. The woman's agenda, I, I remember... Uh, uh, an impromptu uh, um, <clears throat> uh, doorstop with you in 2019 in Parliament where you were talking, you've always uh, punted the women's agenda, uh, uh, making sure that women are represented not only in Parliament but in government and in other um, uh, forms of, of governance as well as in the private sector. Um, how far has the women's agenda uh, uh, gone in this in, in the 30 years of our democracy? Are you happy with where we are? We've made progress, uh, but there's much more to be done. We're not yet where we should be. I think it was wonderful that uh, in President Ramaphosa's uh, first term, uh, cabinet reached 50% uh, female. This was really great, but of course we're 51% of society. But the fact that we were 50-50 was important. Uh, but I know that in many sectors, uh, we've not yet seen the progress we'd like to see. For example, among academics, especially leadership in higher education, I think there's a great deal of work that we need to do to have more women vice chancellors, uh, leading our institutions of higher learning, and leading uh, research uh, as well. So uh, there's a great deal of work. We've got to end violence against women. Uh, this, I believe, is the biggest blight uh, on our society, uh, how uh, uh, we change uh, the attitude of men uh, toward us and also the attitudes of South Africans to violence. You know, the statistics on murder, uh, on robberies, uh, cash in transit ha uh, heists. And, you know, if you uh, live uh, on, <laughs> you know, your own property, you're worried all the time, you know, what's going to happen, what's... You know, my safe and so on. It shouldn't be like that. So I think uh, 
there's a great deal of work that we need to do to just change uh, our society's attitude uh, toward uh, uh, women and ensure that uh, our laws, as well as our practices, uh, support women. You were talking uh, before we began the program about uh, uh, former Minister Lamini Zuma. Uh, she and myself uh, are members of an organization called IWF uh, SA, the uh, International Women's Forum, South Africa branch. Uh, Mem uh, Zanel Mbeki is the patron of IFSA, as we call it. And uh, that organization, when we established a branch in South Africa, we decided the empowerment of young women uh, in leadership, into leadership positions, would be a key project mm. of us as the South African branch. So our uh, first president was Bridget Khadebe. Uh, I became president uh, after her. And all of us were, were members, many leading women. And there are uh, young women uh, that were supported uh, to uh, up take up development programs, particularly through Gibbs at Wits University and other institutions. And uh, this was uh, our effort to contribute to ensuring that young women uh, are provided uh, with the skills uh, and the uh, support to become uh, leaders uh, in their various uh, fields. So this is some of the work uh, that we have done. But even with that plethora uh, of efforts, of which there are many uh, throughout our country, I think the issue of violence against women militates against achieving full equality of women. It's when women are safe uh, in South Africa that we'll know that we've really made progress. Uh, 30 years of democracy, Ma, uh, uh, Doctor, when you look at what you envisioned uh, when you uh, were an activist, um, is this the South Africa you envisioned to a certain degree? Uh, not entirely, but uh, certainly uh, uh, huge uh, success and progress. Let me uh, also share uh, work that we did. I was the co-convener of the uh, Bill of Rights a subcommittee of the Constitutional Assembly. And we were responsible for writing the Bill of Rights chapter for drafting it of the Constitution uh, of South Africa. And largely, the work that we did is the Bill of Rights mm. uh, that you see today. Now, the fact that our people enjoy these human rights and do enjoy them. You know, I was telling uh, a colleague uh, in the US that our people who are poor now have legal aid. They used to go to court without representation, black people, previously. Today we have legal aid, paid for by the state, and you go into court and you are represented by a public prosecutor. It's very, very important that we've made those achievements in water, in housing, in health, in a range uh, of areas. So <clears throat> definitely different uh, from the apartheid experience, but not achieve the level of transformation that one had hoped for. And I think it's these missteps that we've made that lead to, I think, the lack of advance and the failures all of us are aware of. Uh, we campaign during elections. I was campaigning uh, during this election. And uh, I, you know, much as uh, I love being on the ground, you go to a certain household and, you know, the lady says, ah, <laughs> And, you know, you can't pendula. Mm. <laughs> Uh, and you have to say again, no, Susafika, it's in those years. I couldn't project those. Ukleba, ukleba, ute kune project and jen and jen and So it's that sort of failure. Uh, I wish we could uh, upgrade or improve townships into proper suburbs for our people. This is my biggest disappointment: is the living condition of particularly the majority of the black people in our country. I wish we could have done much, much more. So I'm hoping with this current administration 
uh, that the matter of human settlements is going to be pursued with vigorous energy so that we build new communities that have decent human settlements and that actually live in a condition uh, that makes us proud when we go out to engage with communities. I, I will get to, <coughs> to, the, to the new government because I, I do want to hear your views about the new shape of government um, uh, as it relates to, to the, the progress of the country, economic recovery and, and, uh, and joblessness. Okay. But I want to, because I just remembered something when we were talking about the women's agenda and violence against women, the conditioning of, of men. And there's something that Zuma said in an interview, um, I believe it was a couple months back, where she was talking about the Kodesa negotiations and how, as women, they had to go to Utadu Nelson Mandela, the former president, to say that there wasn't adequate re representation yeah. of women in those negotiations, in those meetings. And that was critical given, like you said, 51% of the country is mm. women. Mm. That conditioning, I mean, even in the time of the struggle, uh, as I'm sure you know, there was a conditioning in terms of women, the role of women versus the role of men. Mm. And it's, it's, it's still yeah. uh, entrenched in our society. How do we reverse that where the woman's role um, is, is understood because even within the ANC, the woman's role, sometimes you feel that the woman's role is not really understood. The strength of the woman's role is not really understood to be what it is. And it's not really uh, the platform that women receive is not what the platform men receive. For instance, I still don't understand why the ANC doesn't talk about uh, a, a woman president. Yes, we've had talks about Mamungosa Zanadlamin, but really, um, that is as far as it, 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 it had gone. Mm. Um, how do we change that conditioning? Mm. Well, we've had uh, Dlamini Zuma, but we've also had Sisulu, oh, yeah. who uh, uh, did stand. Uh, we had myself uh, nominated. In the end, I declined. Uh, I now regret doing that, but anyway. Um, I did want to go so, into that as yeah, well. But, yeah, but anyway. <laughs> Um, I, I do think uh, there's work to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I say to young women, don't think the gender struggle is over. You know, just continue. Because uh, there have been victories and people mm -hmm. see progress and then they relax. You must never. Mm -hmm. Until you've achieved the level of equity that we desire, don't give up on a struggle. It always remains a struggle. So the notion of our luta continua is very mm. important in seeking to achieve gender equity. Um, I also uh, uh, think that uh, one of the things that we need to do is always uh, reflect on what is it exactly uh, that we desire. At the moment, 52-plus uh, percent of students at university are female but largely they're in what we call non-critical fields of study. They're not in engineering. Uh, they're not all in the health sciences. Uh, so we've got to break you know, those barriers. And it's really uh, <clears throat> related to its social engineering. Our society has schooled us to think about ourselves in a particular way. And you know, men are not gonna let go easily. I mean. Some of them, you know, they see three women in a room and they start getting nervous, you know. Or when they talk to you, they call you girly. I've had so many men <coughs> calling me girly, you know, and I have to say very politely, uh, could you just use my name? My name is Naledi. I'm not girly. Uh, I'm actually 40 or 50 years old or whatever, mm. you know, I've had to say to, to the individual. And, uh, you know, when you do that and correct them, then they say, oh, she's very aggressive, isn't she? Mm. You know, mm. so a man will not take certain, uh, uh, you know, degradation, but a woman must accept it because our character must be such that we are always accommodating. So these are things uh, we have to resist. Uh, and it's something that we've got to teach our daughters as well, you know, is how do you resist, but resist in a way that will give you success? Because uh, if you, you overfight it, you actually defeat the purpose. 
So it's a, a smart approach, I think, to continuing to struggle for gender uh, equity and finding our own way as well uh, as South Africans. I'll never forget uh, in 1991, which was the first conference of the ANC in South Africa, uh, I was in the conference as a delegate of my province, Western Cape, and uh, Tenjuem, Tinsu, and others raised this issue of a third of the NEC should be female. Ooh. Such an argument ensued with the main objector to such a proposal being Terra Lekota and some other of the leadership. But the women came, you know, they came. Uh, and it went on and on and on. We didn't win the day, but the issue mm. was there. Uh, on the table. It was placed on the table. And it was mm. taken very, very seriously. So, um, you know, uh, men are not going to give way uh, easily. And I think uh, we have to be smart about what we do. So uh, I do think tactics, teaching, mm. you know, uh, tactics is very, very important. How we raise it, you know, I in a meeting. Uh, and, and being ready, because when you raise it, you're saying I'm ready mm. to occupy mm. as well. Um, a chap, I, I complained. There are no women, you know, there aren't enough women around this table. And why is it assumed that a man must be chair? And so a male said, well, then you should chair. And really, I wasn't, <laughs> you know, I wasn't speaking about myself. So that's another thing that happens mm. uh, is that uh, if you speak out, you become burdened. Mm. Uh, with actually taking on this. But it's a challenge, not just for women, it's a challenge for men as well. Because what you're talking about is not women's rights, you're talking about human mm. rights. Why must I be treated differently because of my gender? That in itself is discriminatory. Mm. I should be treated the same way. Of course there are differences, biological, physical, which give result, r rise to particular aspects but these don't mean I can't be a school principal they don't mean I can't be a vice chancellor they don't mean I can't be a dean you know so all of those uh, that are uh, uh, somewhat uh, constructed notions they need to be challenged but who we are in biology or physical uh, is something we live with mm. and it doesn't mean we are less we are diminished uh, by those characteristics. I, I, I'm thinking about when you say that there has to be strategy in, in the way that you you approach these things. And I, I, I often look at you in a table full of powerful individuals from all over the world, superpowers. And uh, I, I often wonder if this is intimidating to you. You are seated next to Mr. Levrov, you're sitting next mm. to Mr. Blinken and so many others. Has there ever been as, as, as a, 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 a female in that position, like you've said, that there is an attitude that, that comes with how they handle women in those positions? Has there, have you ever been felt intimidated? Once or twice, mm. yes. Uh, for example, I don't like alcohol and smoking, uh, and they smoke and they drink. Uh, and, you know, with smoking, I, I'm very clear. So I will tell my best friend, who's a very powerful minister, sorry, not on this table, you know. Uh, but the intimidation would be things like uh, arguments about mm. issues, and they've been, they're more experienced than you are. You're trying to speak for Africa, and they kind of, you know, poo-poo what you say. Uh, you've got to, you know, stand up and, and really uh, uh, take on uh, the issues. Uh, other things are, I think while you might not be intimidated, Sometimes the officials are. So mm. one time, there was an issue with a very strong country, and I was told they will never agree to the position we had as South Africa. And uh, that, you know, if I raised it uh, publicly, I would affect the relationship between our two countries. So then I saw the minister standing somewhere on his own and I told my official, I'm going to raise it with him because I, I think even if we have disagreement, it's important that I've put our country's position forward 
and I seek uh, uh, to uh, 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 get his understanding because he himself comes from a very powerful country mm. and he won't just allow his country to be ridden over roughshod. So I went over to him uh, and I said, I, I need to speak to you confidentially. Uh, and because he speaks another language, I knew he could speak English, but he pretends that he doesn't. <laughs> and so then he said, no, he needs to have a, you know, an interpreter with him. I said, that's fine. Um, so I said, uh, it's a very delicate matter, but it's fine. Uh, I said, it concerns my country and our policy on a particular issue, and I know you're interested in having our support, uh, but I wish to indicate to you that we would not be able, for a range of reasons, and I set those out, uh, we would not be able to support you. To my amazement, he said, I totally understand. Mm. Countries do have uh, different positions, but I know South Africa is a friend and that there will be other uh, occasions, but all I ask, could you do it in this way and not, you know, in a, uh, fine. As long as I'm not betraying mm. my country's standpoint, I'll approach it, you know, as diplomatically as possible. So, you know, I stood up. Uh, I was nervous, I can tell you, because it's a big, big uh, partner. But uh, the reception I got and the friendship we've enjoyed since then uh, indicated to me that when it's an issue of principle, don't back down too mm. easily, mm. you know. Uh, uh, be nervous, be afraid, approach it properly, but don't just give up and say, yo, <laughs> you know, man, too late. <laughs> I think the final question is around the government of national unity. Um, when at the IEC we were receiving those, they were capturing those votes and we could see that the ANC is in no way going to make it back as the majority party. I'm sure you had feelings about it. Um, and then you had to realize that you were forced to go into a coalition and the coalition would form, would... Um, <coughs> necessitate a government of national unity. Mm. Um, what do you think of where we are when we are? Some, because some of your comrades will say that uh, the ANC has gone uh, in uh, and into bed with neoliberals. Uh, this is the ANC selling out. The SACP has said this. What do you think of this formation? Mm. I never, in my thirty years of being in Parliament, imagined the ANC would be in a unity with the Democratic Alliance. So I'm still getting used to it. Uh, and I'm on a brief, a watching brief. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Ma.